Hello, my name is Chris Miskaitis. I'm an application engineer with Oriental Motor. In this seminar, we're going to be discussing step motor fundamentals and solutions dealing with step motors. So let's first talk about step motor design. We're going to say that a step motor is very similar to a brushless DC motor in its design. Uh, by saying that, what I mean is that we're going to have permanent magnets on the inside of the motor on its rotor. So behind rotor cup number one and rotor cup number two, there will be uh, permanent magnets. And then on the outside of the motor, on the stator, there's going to be windings. Um, like any motor, we're going to say that we're going to look to be converting power. So we're going to take in electrical power, we're going to convert that over into rotation. Um, but the difference here is that we're going to be looking to move in fixed increments. And we're going to make this a positioning device. So it's not just a speed control device like many other types of motors. We are going to be moving um, in a positioning type uh, application. So an important function of a step motor is how accurate they can be. Our accuracy is going to be three arc minutes. So that's the worst case how far off we can be when we tell the motor to move. So what does that actually mean? It's 50 thousandths of a degree or putting it in a different, uh, a little bit different light. If our step motor somehow was able to shoot an arrow, we'd be able to hit a bullseye 80 feet away and if that bullseye was 1.7 inches in diameter. So somewhere in that range. Might not be dead center, but it would be somewhere in that bullseye. Now our repeatability is almost perfect. So if the step motor took one complete revolution, shot another arrow, we'd be almost perfect and we'd probably split that arrow. So there are cases when we're more accurate than that three arc minutes. That's just a worst case scenario. So, uh, a couple features on step motors here. Um, number one, the number of steps is going to equal the number of pulses. So what we're going to do is send pulses out from a controller, from a PLC, from somewhere. And one pulse is going to equal a certain amount of degrees of motion. Couple those pulses together and you make a complete move. Now how fast we send those pulses out is going to determine how fast the motor moves. So we're going to say that our output speed equals our input frequency. Another very important uh, feature of a step motor is that it has small non-cumulative error. So we discussed the error, worst case, three arc minutes. Uh, but it's very important to notice that that's not going to accumulate up. So if I make one step or a million steps, the most that I can be off is that three arc minutes. Uh, we'll also say that uh, step motors are designed to be run open loop. We don't need any encoders. Uh, we don't need to close that loop if we don't want to. So that could be a, a big cost savings for our system. Now there's always those applications where you feel that you need to close the loop for that verification. Um, we'll talk about those options later in the seminar, but for right now, it's uh, let's think of them as open loop. So as long as we size them properly, they'll make the move that we tell them to. Um, another point here, highest torque per volume. So for a given frame size motor, step motor is going to have the highest torque for that frame size. The reason for that is that we're able to energize all of the copper wire inside the motor at a given time. Because of that, we're going to see a very quick response. So very quick acceleration, very quick deceleration. Um, so fast, quick movements are really what step motors are, are very good at. So what do we need in order to get a step motor system running? It's going to be these components right here. So number one, we're going to need a start signal. It could be me pressing a start button, or it could be coming from a PLC, or some kind of a master, you know, master controller. But something needs to tell our system when to start moving. Uh, next, we're going to need a controller, um, a PLC pulse card, some sort of pulse generator where we're going to write our programs in, tell the motor how far and how fast to move. Uh, next, we need a driver. So what the driver does is it takes the pulses from the controller and it's going to tell the motor which phases need to be energized at what time. Um, finally, we do need the motor and then finally the load that we're trying to move. Um, right now, I have the motor circled. We're going to focus on the motor design. 
on how the motor actually functions. And then later on in the seminar, we'll discuss more of the package, more of these products, like the driver. Internally, a step motor looks like this. We're going to see that we have eight poles. So we'll see one, two, three, four, all the way up to eight here, all the way around eight poles. And we're going to label those uh, with two different phases. So the green are going to be the A phase, and the blue are the B phase. Uh, the way that the copper wires wound around each pole, we'll see that they're opposite. So right here on the top, we'll wind the wire toward the rotor. And on this one, it'll be away from the rotor. Toward the rotor and away from the rotor. What that means is that if I have current flowing down that, that coil, I can make this a north pole and this a south pole. This would be a north pole and this would be a south pole. Now, if I have current flow the opposite direction, I would change the polarity on each one of the poles. Another important uh, function here is that we see that the Rotor is actually magnetized, which means that one half is going to be a north pole, one half is going to be a south pole. Right now, let's take a look at the rotor as if we're looking at the north pole. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cycle current flowing through each one of these windings. So I have an A phase, a B phase, an A bar phase, and a B bar phase. As I rotate current through there, I'm going to be able to line up my teeth on my rotor and the teeth on the stator at different locations. So if I create a south pole on phase A, the, the teeth on the rotor and the teeth on the stator will be directly lined up at 12 o'clock. And it will be directly in between each other on the A bar phase. Directly lined up here and directly in between right here. Now then I can move my south pole to my B phase. Now we'll line up directly here. Then to my A bar phase, and then to my B bar phase, and I'll be cycling that south pole around in the clockwise direction. Every time I move from one phase, my A, to my B phase, I'm going to be moving a certain amount of degrees. Uh, if we take a look at the, the, the rotor here, we're going to see that 360 degrees in the circle Divide that by a standard motor will have 50 teeth on its rotor. So 360, divide that by 50, we come up with 7.2 degrees from one tooth to the next tooth on the rotor. But I'm not going to move an entire tooth pitch every time I move from A phase to my B phase. Because of the geometry, I'm only moving one quarter of a tooth pitch. So let's divide that 7.2 by 4 and I come up with 1.8 degrees of motion per pulse. So that's a standard step motor. We're also going to see that there's ways mechanically to get 0.9 degrees, 0.72 degrees, and 0.36 degrees per pulse. We'll talk about those a little bit later in the seminar, um, but just know that there's mechanical ways to change that uh, degree per pulse. Once we get the motor moving, it's going to act according to a torque speed curve. That's the performance that we'll get out of the motor. So on this curve, we're going to see on our x-axis down here, we have our speed, typically in hertz or pulses per second. On the y-axis, we'll have our torque in ounce inches or newton meters, typically. The first point here is at zero RPM. We'll see our holding torque. Um, when we have rated current flowing through the winding, that's how much torque we'll get at zero RPM. Our second curve here, we're going to call the pull-in torque curve. So that's this curve right here. Anywhere on or below this curve, we can start, we can stop, and we can reverse instantly. So you don't have to start a step motor at zero RPM and accelerate from there. We can start somewhere in this range and then accelerate up. Um, we'll also see that our pull-in torque curve has a maximum starting speed. Um, the pull-in torque curve changes based on the load that we have attached to the motor, so you'll typically not see this curve listed in a catalog. What you will see is a little, a little tick mark by your maximum starting speed. 
So it'll be a little mark at this point. You'll know that that's the maximum that you can start um, starting speed. Um, it will be slightly less than that because you'll have some load attached to it, but it gives you a general idea of where you can start. Next curve here is called the pull-out torque curve. That's typically what's shown in every catalog. So that will show our maximum running speed. Anywhere on or below, the motor can run in synchronism. It might not be able to start stop instantly all the way out here. In that case, we would have to start in this region, accelerate up into this region, run for a while, and then we would decelerate back down into this range in order to stop accurately. Um, we never want to get outside of this pull-out torque curve because out here the motor is going to stall out. So it's very important when sizing a step motor that we don't size it to be right on or very near this curve because any addition in friction or, or a little bit more torque that's needed might push you above that range and then the motor is going to stall out. So we typically do add some safety factor to our, to our motors when we do size them. So when we're moving a step motor, we don't just, it's not going to stop like it hits a brick wall. There will be some overshooting and some undershooting. So we'll see here that as we, as we rotate, there's some overshoot, some undershoot. This is normal. Uh, there's also going to be ranges where we're going to overshoot and undershoot more than what's normal. That's called our resonance range. So that's the natural frequency of the motor. Um, and at that frequency range, we will overshoot, undershoot more. You're going to hear um, a little bit, a little bit more noise. Also, get more vibration out of the motor in this range. So it's not just an audible, you know, kind of annoying sound. There are um, disadvantages to running in this range as well. There's a better chance that you're going to miss a step in this range, and that would put you somewhere that you don't know where you're at anymore. So you wouldn't know until you drill a hole in the wrong spot or your, your application just doesn't function properly. So that would be one downside on running this open loop. You wouldn't have that knowledge. However, there's ways around this resonance. So we can calculate this out. Um, the equation looks like this, where N is going to be our number of rotor teeth. TH is going to be our holding torque and JR is our rotor inertia. So as my rotor inertia gets larger, my holding torque also gets larger. What that means is that this, this equation, when we calculate it out for a couple different motors, typically stays around the same range. We'll see if PK245, 264, and 299, they're all in the same general range of maybe 100 to 200, maybe 250 hertz. So what we can do really easily is we can just avoid that range. So that's the easiest way. We can normally start and stop in a step motor outside of that range. My maximum starting speed is almost always faster than your resonance range. So that's the easiest. Another way that we can do that is to accelerate quickly. Uh, we can also add a damper on the back shaft of a motor. So a damper looks like this. It will add a little bit of inertia. Um, it will dampen um, some of that vibration. Another way to do that is to make sure that we match the motor to the load properly. This all comes down to sizing the motor properly. Um, we don't want a motor that's very large to move a very small load. All of that excess torque is going to go out into vibration when we do that. So it's very important that we, we don't oversize step motors. They have to be properly sized um, in order to rotate properly, or you might miss steps. Um, the last thing here is a smaller step angle. So we saw that there were mechanical ways, I mentioned, to get a smaller step angle. So let's take a look at those. This is the standard motor that we talked about a few slides ago. I have eight different poles. I have two phases, the A and the B, and a 50-tooth rotor. Every pulse that I send it, we're going to move 1.8 degrees. So let's take a look at what that looks like um, inside the motor.
All right, so we can see here there's eight different poles. We'll see the copper wires wound around here, and we'll see the eight different poles all the way around there. We can also see the teeth that are on the stator here. We'll see teeth on each one of these poles. Inside this, what we typically or always have is going to be the rotor. So here's our rotor. We'll see that there's two different um, sides there, a north pole and a south pole, and we have teeth that are all the way around. So this will have 50 teeth on it. Another design that we're going to take a look at is going to go 0.9 degrees. So in order to move 0.9 degrees per pulse, what we do is we have 100 teeth on the rotor instead of 50 teeth. That's going to increase our resolution, so our number of stopping points, and it's going to decrease our vibration. So let's take a look at what that looks like inside of our motor. So we can see a much finer teeth on the stator here. Let's see, much finer. We're still going to have the same number of poles around the motor, but the teeth are much smaller. And then also on our rotor, we can see the teeth are much smaller than they were on the previous motor. So there's going to be 100 teeth now instead of 50. And we'll move 0.9 degrees per pulse. Next type of motor is going to move 0.72 degrees per pulse. We're going to see that we have 10 poles now instead of 8, and we're going to have 5 phases. A, B, C, D, and E phase. Every time I move this motor, it's going to move one tenth of a tooth pitch instead of one quarter. So if I take 7.2 degrees from one tooth to the next with a 50 tooth rotor, divide that by 10, I get 0.72 degrees. So let's take a look at this motor internally. So we can see the teeth are still larger because it's, it's made for the 50 tooth rotor. But we do have more poles. There's going to be 10 poles now instead of 8. So if you count these around, you get 10 instead of 8. Now if we take a look at the rotor, the rotor looks identical to the first that we looked at. It still has 50 teeth, and it will still have a north pole and a south pole to it. And finally, what we're going to take a look at is going to be a stepping of 0.36 degrees per pulse. So this uses the same rotor as our 0.9 degree, but we're going to use uh, the stator with 10 poles on it. So much finer teeth. I don't, have, uh, I don't have one to take a look at internally, but it's basically a combination of what we have looked at already. It's going to have 100 teeth on the rotor, and it's going to have the 10 different poles internally on the uh, Stator. Now, if anyone has any questions on stepping motor theory, feel free to give us a call. Tech support number is 800-468-3982, or you can email us at techsupport at orientalmotor.com. Thank you for attending.